It took me a long time to truly appreciate the magnificence of Carnival of Souls, and due to its hypnotic, dreamlike quality, I wasn't actually capable of watching it in one sitting until my fifth attempt, as every other try had me drifting asleep. And I don't mean that in a bad sense either. It's not a boring or dreary film at all. It just has this unique aura that, much like our protagonist Mary Henry, can make us drift across into a different plane of existence. That church organ score by Gene Moore vibrates your brain and almost massages you into a state of tiredness, invading your consciousness and allowing you to slip into the very odd world of Carnival of Souls. Herc Harvey's 1962 masterwork has all the hallmarks of effectively being a feature-length episode of The Twilight Zone. Mary is a part of a drag race gone wrong where a car crashes off a bridge into a river and she is the only person to get out alive. However, from this point on, her life is never the same again. A talented organist, Mary travels to Utah for a new job in a church. While en route, she gets her first of many glimpses of a strange man that will come back to haunt her again and again. Just look at both of those scares right there. They are in effect jump scares, but they're massively understated. There isn't a properly loud bang to bombard the viewer's senses. Instead, the visuals do all the work here, as we witness the man who becomes the leader of the souls in effect, and is played by Herc Harvey himself. The man doesn't even do anything throughout the film. He spends the entire time simply staring at Mary from afar, but that's what makes him such an important Causing danger. He's hands down one of my favourite cinematic villains for literally no other reason than the way he looks and the way he gazes into the eyes of Mary and vice versa into the camera at the audience. The man starts to appear as Mary passes by an abandoned carnival at the end of a boardwalk, a place that we visit several times throughout the film and acts as the epicentre of the souls and their hauntings. The landscape and architecture of the carnival make it one one of my favourite places seen on screen. It's a dreamlike location. I feel like at some point in time, all of us have wandered a strange place like this in our dreams and nightmares alike. A place that at one point in time was full of joy and happiness, now just a vacant shell where only echoes of a foregone time reside. Plus, the way Harvey directs the carnival sequences, ugh, it's shot after shot after shot of beauty. This particular shot towards the end of the film is one of my single favourite frames ever in cinema. Just look at those silhouettes of Mary and the building coinciding. It's straight out of another realm. Even outside of the carnival, there are dozens of shots in this film I could see framed in a macabre horror film art museum. It's one of the most beautiful horror films I've ever seen, and despite having a colourised version, I could never imagine Carnival of Souls in anything other than black and white. It's just one of those movies that's meant to be in black and white. The shades of grey and twining and tangling together with the hypnotic music, psychological plot, and otherworldly ethereal threats stalking our protagonist complement the entire piece and enhance its nature. If I can best describe Carnival of Souls, it's like a horror movie that was filmed in a traumatised person's subconscious and then edited in the waking world. The climax here, when all of the other souls chase after Mary, popping up and frightening her, going after her at an increased frame rate, or even some slightly earlier segments where Mary runs onto a bus for help and it's just entirely populated with souls staring back at her, make this one of my favourite finales to a horror movie. It's so simply and cheaply done, but utilises its filmmaking qualities in a way that makes them more effective than horror movies with 10 times its budget. In 1962, the entire film cost $33,000. Translating that into current money, that's around around $314,000. That is astonishing value, and it's devastating that Carnival of Souls was Herc Harvey's one and only feature film. His potential for future projects will forever be one of the great what-ifs of cinema, but Carnival has garnered a large cult following and was a huge inspiration to filmmakers including David Lynch and George A. Romero. You'd think that because of my commentary so far on the film, I love it, right? Yeah, I 
absolutely do. In terms of nightmare fuel, the atmosphere, understated scares, the man and his souls, the isolated location of the carnival, and a tense, dread-inducing atmosphere that even leads to Mary ending up in a world where everyone is silent and she is invisible. Make this one of the deepest wells of nightmare fuel to date. But there's one greater source of nightmare fuel, and one glaring reason why this isn't a perfect film like it should be. My single most hated character in movie history. It's my displeasure to introduce... John Linden. Just talking about this sleazy, slimy, pervy prick is enough to put me off. I actually can't believe I'm wasting my time and energy typing up a video script for this guy and then talking into a microphone now. Then I've been through an editing process all for the sake of this arsehole. But I feel like I'll never settle without talking about him on the channel at some point. I've got to bury this hatchet, and John Linden makes me want to bury it, deep into his seedy, pathetic skull. When Mary moves to Utah for her new job, she moves into a rented room, and in the room opposite her is the most disgusting excuse of a man ever put to film. John simply cannot take no for an answer. He forces himself onto Mary time and time again, hitting her up with chat line after chat line, perving on her and watching her get changed. He skulks at her door trying to worm his way into her bedroom, constantly badgers her to go out with him for dinner or a drink or a dance, and every time you can see Mary is uncomfortable, yet John just keeps on coming. He thinks he's the dog's bollocks but is nothing less than dog shit. He's a belittling arsehole who only talks about how much of a womanizer he is and that all of Mary's needs in her life can come directly from him. Despite her resisting him, for some reason she agrees to go out with him one night, and he is a full-on dickhead to her. He bullies her for not wanting to drink or dance. He spent all this time desperate and thirsty to go out with her, and now he's out with her, he chooses to verbally abuse her and shoot her down. I wish John met a deadly end here. He deserved every one of the souls to tear him apart. He is without question my most detested character in film history. And it's not just because of his character, it's because he dampens the mastery and beauty of Carnival of Souls. I want to watch this film over and over again, but every time I do, I have this awkward cringe in my gut, wanting to delete John from it entirely. Maybe that's what should be released, the non-John cut. Just remove him entirely from the film, and you'll have a much more rich experience. He's the main source of nightmare fuel here. But John aside, I do adore this film, and think it's a must-watch for horror fans. It might not be to your tastes, it's rather specific, kind of like an A24 film from 60 years ago. But fans of Aster or Eggers or Lynch, that kind of dreamy and abstract horror, you should love this one. Just skip past the John scenes. What do you lot think of Carnival of Souls? Let me know down in the comments below. And until next time, ghoul gang, I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls. Remember, no means no. Treat and respect anyone you try to approach sexually who is uncomfortable about your presence, both for their good and yours. The man is watching.